You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to be making a miniature ion propulsion device. Now, before we get started, I did receive a couple more letters in the mail, so let's go ahead and address those. This first letter comes all the way from Australia, and it's from Taj Boss. And so he's a 12-year-old who's been working on some projects. And in fact, he showed one of the projects right here. That looks pretty cool. Anyways, he has also sent me a lovely picture, and that's right here. So thank you so much, Taj, for sending me this letter and this picture. It's very awesome. And our next letter comes from West Valley, Utah, which is just a little ways away from where I am. And he says he really likes the videos on radio transmission, and that him and his friends have tried to make a radio station, but the local regulations made it a little bit too hard for them. And so I'm sorry about that. I haven't really, to be honest, looked up many regulations in this area, so I don't know how many I'm breaking. Anyways, he also says that I should use one of those things, those weird devices, to hang up the letters rather than using a baseball bat. I'm not sure why, it seems more inefficient. But anyways, uh, he also shows that he has a YouTube channel, and so that channel will be linked in the description below, and it says that he does uh, gaming live streams and stuff with his friends, so that sounds kind of cool. You guys should go check it out and support him. So now I'm going to go ahead and hang these up on the wall that's over there, it's getting a little bit full right now, but uh, there should be a place to put them. So now before we get into making our ion propulsion device, let's learn what it is and how it works. Now before we talk about how the ion propulsion actually works, we should probably talk about what an ion is in case you don't know. An ion is just an element with a different number of electrons from the amount of protons inside it. So if it has more electrons than protons, it's going to have a net negative charge, and if it has less electrons than protons, it's going to have a net positive charge. And in fact, for oxygen, we see two common ions. One of them is going to be O2 minus, because that'll complete the shell that I'll show you guys in a second. And another one is just going to be O plus. And that's just going to be because it completes a subshell. Now what I mean by shell is that the amount of electrons inside oxygen, since its periodic table number is eight, is eight. However, there are only six valence electrons, meaning electrons on the outside. So filling it in, we can see that there's two electrons here on the 1s orbital, two electrons on the 2s orbital, and then the 2p has one, two, three, and four electrons. Now you may have noticed that I was filling it in left to right. That's because the electrons repel each other, and so they're going to want to occupy as far away suborbitals as they can before they have to get close to another electron. And so if we were to knock out an electron from this oxygen atom, we would see that this would be knocked out right here, and then it would be a little bit more stable because this subshell is complete. However, if we were to also add two more electrons, we'd see that this subshell would be completely filled up, meaning it would be a very stable atom. And in fact, in the periodic table, we call these noble gases. Not the ions, I mean, just uh, eight valence electron atoms. So how can you use turning an atom into an ion to propel something? Well, as we look at the positive charge here, what's happening is that the electrons are being pulled away from the atoms inside of this. And that also creates a net positive charge up here. And from that, down here, we have the similar thing happening where the electrons are going to be pulled up to the top here. And then when the electrons fly through the air, they're going to be hitting off electrons from other atoms, turning them into ions. In fact, we can calculate the amount of ions that we can be creating with certain energy and the momentum of the electron going off by using the electron work equation. And so if you're curious, that equation looks like this. We have the amount of energy required to knock off the electron, and that's going to be negative, and we're going to be subtracting that away from the total amount of energy we have going into the system. And that's going to be equal to one-half mass times velocity squared. Now the mass here is going to be equal to the mass of the electron, which is 9.01, approximately anyways, times 10 to the negative 31st power. This is a constant that's going to be different for every element, and even depending on the state of the element, because the first ionization might not be equal to the second ionization. In fact, it most definitely won't be equal to the first ionization energy required, and so you're going to pretty much have to look that one up. But by computing all this, we can figure out the velocity, and use that to figure out even the momentum of the electron that's going to be leaving the atom. This is one of the factors that contributes to a little bit of the thrust, but it's practically negligible compared to the other factors. And so going back up here on this sharp object, we have an increasing positive charge as the electrons get drawn away, and this negative charge is also increasing as the electrons build up on the top here, drawn to that positive charge. And across this, we're going to have a sort of dielectric effect, creating a capacitance. Um, if you want to learn more about capacitors, I made a video on capacitors a little while back, and so I'll have that linked in the description below, so you guys can learn a little bit more about this force. But it basically uses Coulomb's law and all of that just to sort of uh, have a difference in charges and that attraction between them. And so from that electron zooming across, it's going to knock off one of those electrons from, for instance, the oxygen atom. And when this happens, it's going to have a net positive charge on the oxygen atom, since there are going to be more protons than electrons. And since it has that negative charge, it's going to go zooming towards the negative charge one, because that's what it's drawn to. However, rather than hitting it, a lot of the times it's going to miss it slightly and just create this momentum going this direction. 
and that is where most of our propulsion force is coming from. So in simple ways, that's pretty much how an ion propulsion motor works. Although ion propulsion doesn't really generate enough thrust to get a satellite through Earth's atmosphere and out of Earth's gravity, it does, however, inside of the vacuum of space, create a very nice way to reach insanely fast speeds. A major difference though from here on Earth and in space is that in space there's not going to be quite as many atoms floating around. In fact, it's going to be near zero since it's practically a vacuum. And so to combat this problem, inside of the satellite's fuel, they actually just have a bunch of xenon. Now yes, xenon is a noble gas, so it is going to be harder to get that first ionization energy compared to something like, um, sodium. However, unlike sodium, xenon is a gas and it's non-reactive, so it's not going to mess up the other instruments within the satellite if something bad happens. And they use xenon compared to something like argon or neon simply because it has more mass, and so for the amount of energy you're putting into it, you get around twice as much thrust as you would from something like argon. Now this works in practically the exact same way as I showed above. You basically have the xenon atoms going in, then passing through this high voltage chamber which is going to ionize it, then the ions are going to be attracted to the negative grate, which are then going to pass through, and then as they fly out it's going to provide a forward momentum for the satellite. And so hopefully now you guys have a general understanding about how ion propulsion works. And so let's go ahead and build a little model of an ion propulsion. This model of an ion propulsion that we're going to build is a very popular model called an ionocraft. Now this model has been being made for a long time as far as I can tell, however the first time I was exposed to it was from a website called ribstar.org and he also gives instructions on how to build it, and so I'll have that linked in the description if you guys want to check it out. But basically it's going to look something like this, where down here is going to be aluminum foil, and then up here we'll probably have a thin gauge wire, so probably like 32 gauge. And so the wire on top is going to act like a sharp point while the aluminum on the bottom is going to act like a rounded spot. As I discussed earlier, the amount of thrust produced by this is extremely low, and so we're going to want to make this as light as possible. In past iterations of this that I built myself, I've actually even used spaghetti noodles for this. It was pretty delicate though, and so this time I'm just going to be using balsa wood, which is still very delicate, but should hold up better probably and look a little bit more presentable. Anyways, this top wire is then going to be connected to our high voltage positive, while the bottom here is going to be connected to the high voltage negative. And then from this we should be able to see it lift off the ground. And so let's go ahead and build this module here. To start off building this I cut out this piece of aluminum foil. It's around 30 centimeters wide and about 5 centimeters in width. And so now I'm going to cut three increments of this balsa wood at about uh, 9.75 centimeters each. Now as you can see I have them positioned in such a way that this will be able to fit in between them. And so now I'm going to use some of this super glue to glue it down into this positioning here. This way we'll be able to fold it over and then we'll put in these three prongs and then we'll be able to fold it up into the triangle shape. Now that it's super glued into place, we just need to take this aluminum and fold it over the balsa wood like so. This way we'll be creating that round surface that we need. Okay, cool, right? Simple enough anyways. Um, let's go ahead and cut some more balsa wood. Okay, so now I'm just going to go ahead and cut three more 12 centimeter segments of balsa wood. And these will act as the three prongs to hold it up. Okay, now I'm going to fold this over onto itself, and then using that little gap, I'm going to put that aluminum over here, and then glue it into place, making an equilateral triangle. Now the last thing we need to do is glue our three balsa wood supports into the corners of the equilateral triangle. And so I find it best to probably glue it up around that far up the base, uh, but you guys can do it differently. It's not a super solid science. And so, yeah. And now with the three posts glued into place, we just need to attach that sharp terminal end that the positive wire will be connected to. In order to do that, I'm going to be using this 32 gauge magnet wire. So I'm going to go ahead and get a length of it. And then while leaving around a foot of wire, I'm going to go ahead and sand all the enamel off the rest of the wire. This way it'll be able to make a nice connection point between the air. Because as the magnet wire currently sits, it has a glass enamel coating over it to make sure that it doesn't conduct with itself when you're making, for instance, coil. And that's why it's called magnet wire. But yeah, just go ahead and sand off that enamel. And so I'm just going to go ahead and start by winding one loop around this first post, and then a second loop around this second post, and then a third loop around this third post, and then I'm just going to bring it back over to the first post with one more loop to connect it up. As you do this, try to make sure that the wire is positioned vertically evenly throughout, as that'll make it kind of work quite a bit better. So yeah, make sure you do that, otherwise it'll be a little bit more erratic. The final thing we need to do is take a wire and connect it up to the aluminum skirt that wraps around it. And so I'm just going to use a little bit of scotch tape to do that, and there we go. This wire is going to be what we connect to the high voltage negative to, while this wire is going to be, of course, the high voltage positive. And with that final step done, our ion craft is complete. Now, of course, you do need a high voltage power supply that outputs a DC high voltage to run this. If you need help on trying to figure out how to make that, I have made a few videos showing how to make a few different variations of a DC high voltage power supply, and so I'll have those linked in the description below. Okay, now I have it all hooked up, and as you can see when I turn on the power, it generates a little bit of thrust. Also kind of fun, if you can see in my oscilloscope in the background, whenever I connect up the power, it wirelessly picks up the energy and you can see that sine wave given off. And also it looks kind of, oh no. Well, I'll fix that, I guess. 
See, that's probably happening because I'm trying to run it off of the thing that ran my arc club, and I'm guessing it's allowing a bit too much current to pass through. So that when it does get a little arc like that, it just jumps up and draws a lot of current, and that is way more than enough to light the balsa wood on fire. Okay, so now it's fixed and it's working properly. I have it tethered down because it was just keep on flipping over and such like that. And so I'm actually using the same power supply that I was using before. Um, this is version 3 though of the one I've made, just because the other two have gone up into flames. Because when it would arc over, the plasma would be hot enough just to light it all up. And so yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at it. As you can see, right when I apply the power, it creates that force and it just floats up off the ground. And I imagine it could float a little bit higher probably if I more optimized where the wires were. And also it's tethered down so it can't float that high as you can see. Um, so yeah, that's kind of cool I think. And it's definitely a pretty good demonstration. Let me go ahead and turn off the lights um, just so that you guys can see the purple corona given off by this as it goes. And hopefully it should look pretty cool. So yeah, just one second with that. Okay, so it's kind of hard to see. But if you look closely, you can kind of see the purple glow given off by where the electrons are jumping off the metal. I was expecting there to be slightly more corona, but I suppose this is good because that means that it's nowhere near arcing over. Um, because arcing over is then what causes it to burst into flames. So it's good that there's this little corona, but it also means that I could probably move the wires all down a little bit to get a little bit more thrust going upwards, and that would probably give us more corona. I just don't want to risk it just because of the fact that it keeps on going up in flames. So, yeah. Okay, so one last thing I should mention in this video. So this does require a very high voltage, and if you were to touch it, I don't think it would kill you because I touched it earlier and it just left a big burn mark on my finger, which isn't here because that was a couple days ago. But it does hurt very bad and could possibly kill you if it shocked you in the right place. So do not uh, basically do this unless you have proper training and uh, proper safety and all that. Yeah. Okay, also one more, one more thing. So I have a candle here, and I just wanted to show you guys the ion wind given off by this. So let me go ahead and light this. So as you can see, the flame of the candle is obviously being affected. In fact, that just barely blew it out because of all the ions basically flying down and hitting into it. Uh, in fact, an interesting thing, if you could see that, was that the smoke, I believe, would have been being drawn up towards one of these because the smoke in itself is also ions. And so, yeah, that's kind of interesting, I guess. So now you know how an ion-powered thruster works and how you can build a very simple model of one. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. So a quick heads up, next episode we are going to have a giveaway because the company actually sponsored to have a few pocket oscilloscopes given away to some of you guys. And so yeah, in the next episode leave a comment below if you want to be in that. But anyways, if you enjoyed this video and or learned something new, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the thumbs up button as it really helps the channel. And if you'd like to see my science videos, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so they'll show up in your subscription newsfeed. Also, a special thanks to all you Patreons who help make these videos possible. Uh, their names are right here if you want to see them. If you have a suggestion for a video you'd like to see in the future, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. And so that's all I have for you guys this week. Please remember to be safe and have a wonderful day. You're watching Keystone Science. And in today's episode, we're going to show you how to make a very simple plasma arc lighter.